All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's session of Coffee and Conversation, The Civil War of Military History, Part 2. Uh, Coffee and Conversation is co-sponsored by Bethlehem Senior Projects, Inc., and this four-part series is funded by a grant from Humanities New York. As I said, this is a four-part series. Um, if you're interested in the other sessions, you can sign up on our programming calendar on the Public Library's website. Each session, you need to sign up for each session individually. Um, before we get started, I want to make sure and let everyone know that we are recording this. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask them throughout the program. You can type your question in the chat box or turn on your microphone and ask yourself. Uh, I would ask that unless you're talking, please mute yourself. And now I'd like to introduce our speaker, Giacomo Calabria. He is a scholar with Humanities New York and has given programs such as the Federalist Papers and Democracy in America here in the past. And here you go. Excellent. Thank you so much for that invitation. And of course, um, thank you, Mary, and to everyone over at Bethlehem Public Library who's organized this. To all of you who are here, thank you so much for being present. We will be continuing our discussion on the Civil War, this time focusing a little bit more on um, the second year of the Civil War and the first full year, which is 1862. Before we get into that, though, I do want to touch over a few aspects of the military science of the war that we didn't get into last class. So for those of you who weren't, who weren't here, this should be um, a welcome refresher. And uh, for those of you who were here, this is um, basically the latter half of what I wanted to cover last week. So let's just quickly jump into that for sake of time. So let's see, where were we for that? Here we are. Yeah, so I wanted to go into a little bit more detail of the weapons specifically during the war, just so everyone is on the same, uh, everyone's on the same uh, level when it comes to what exactly we are talking about when it comes to uh, mid 19th century warfare. So a quick refresher, I start every class with this, um, with just a, you know, just letting everybody know what exactly the United States looked like during the Civil War. This map over here during 1861, uh, this is at the point where all 11 states have seceded from the Confederacy. And uh, as I say before, please keep in mind that the United States, especially during the time period, is an enormous country, the distance between Massachusetts and Los Angeles is the same as the distance between Paris and Moscow. It's one example I always like using. And another is that um, for so many of the people in this country during this time period, they really did view themselves as completely different people in the sense where a common expression that they had during this time period, which actually, it's a joke that still works today, where they said, if a Southerner slapped you in the face, you would challenge them to the duel. If a New Yorker slapped you in the face, uh, oh, no, wait, let me rephrase that. Okay, so the expression went, if you slapped a Southerner in the face, he would challenge you to a duel. If you slapped a Yankee in the face, he would sue you. A little bit uh, aspect of Yankee and uh, Southern aspect that has remained a little bit, I, I could say. There, there are a lot of lawsuits in the United States these days. But very quickly, just, um, in terms of numbers, you can see over here, the North has overwhelmingly advantages when it comes to munitions, industry, population. Keep in mind, when it comes to that Southern population of 9 million, uh, several million of those, I've seen uh, about three and a half million are enslaved. And ultimately it's really cotton, which is the main advantage that the South has in terms of America. This is really good. Excuse me? No problem. All right, so I'm um, just continuing on. We closed with this discussion on or with this passage from Abraham Lincoln's first inaugural. And again, before we go into the first full year of the war, 1862, I want to have a very brief recap on militarily what both sides had going into this first full year of the war. So very quickly, the Battle of Fort Sumter fought um, yeah, roughly, uh, we just passed the anniversary of it a few days ago. Uh, when it comes to the Battle of Fort Sumter, it is called the opening shots of the Civil War. There were cannons that were fired before this time period, specifically when Fort Sumter was in the process of being um, 
uh, what's the word? Um, when reinforcements were trying to go there, over there were trying to bring in uh, additional munitions. Uh, however, the Battle of Fort Sumter, without a doubt, is the turning point where secession became a militarily hostile action on the United States border. So very quickly, when it comes to Fort, Sum uh, Fort Sumter in Charleston, South Carolina, uh, worth mentioning, South Carolina is actually the first state in the Confederacy that seceded. It would have, um, the Union would have 85 men. It's worth mentioning that there were many Fort Sumters throughout the South, by which I mean Fort Sumter was a federal base, essentially. And there were many of them throughout the entire Confederacy. There were also national banks, there were arsenals. The difference between Fort Sumter and them is that when all of those previous areas were basically looted by the Confederacy, they went without a fight. And most of this was because it happened during the presidency of James Buchanan, Abraham Lincoln's predecessor. Fort Sumter, without a doubt, Abraham Lincoln and um, War Department, they tried to reinforce it, they tried to have them supplied, and it is a place where ultimately the first exchange of fire is gonna be happening during the Civil War. As you can see, the men are overwhelmingly outnumbered in terms of Confederates. We don't know how many were there, but we have reason to believe it was in the thousands. Uh, the negotiations and the question over whether or not to surrender Fort Sumter is ultimately, the case could be made. This is one of the first strategic decisions the U.S. military is making with respect to the Confederacy during the Civil War. As Abraham Lincoln said in his first inaugural, that we will not fire the first shot, but we will defend ourselves. He's essentially laying out the blueprint for how politically the war is going to be sold to the public, which is the Confederacy would and did fire the first shot of the American Civil War on April 12th at 4.30 a.m. You can see over here the situation. Fort Sumter was designed to defend the interior of Charlton Har of um, Charleston Harbor. It was not designed to be able to sustain a barrage from Charleston itself. So it was in a militarily focused position. And with respect to the Union forces, they could have retreated, they could have surrendered without a fight. They fighted out an exchange fire. And ultimately this exchange, where there are no casualties during this exchange, no um, soldiers die. There is eventually during the retreat, they had a formal um, canade that was following the lowering the flag of Fort Sumter. Unfortunately, there was one death when it came to that. But ultimately the Union is forced to surrender these units. Uh, eventually, I do believe the commanding officer at Fort Sumter, he actually surrendered to one of his former students at West Point, um, Pierre Gustave Tutan Beauregard. We'll be hearing Beauregard again. And it's after the uh, surrender at Fort Sumter, again, just um, what a year for anniversaries. Mid-April is when you have all the really big Civil War anniversaries, uh, good and bad, unfortunately, happening at the same time. This is where Abraham Lincoln puts out his call for 75,000 volunteers which results in Virginia, Arkansas, Tennessee, and North Carolina joining the seven previous states in the deep south that had seceded. So this situation, both sides are militarily preparing for war. And just so everyone is familiar, this is what civil warfare is going to be like in uh, the remaining years. So essentially when it comes to weapons, they're broken down into three main branches, which we'll be going into. The first is infantry, and the infantry will be using rifles and rifle muskets. A rifle musket is simply a musket which has had grooves added to its barrel so that it is now able to fire uh, bullets in um, one of the specific, I'll be getting into the bullets themselves. And uh, when it comes to sidearms, you would have officers would have pistols and swords, and uh, also any infantry that had a rifle would have a bayonet that would be fixed on it. I know that many times in movies, you know, the whole charging of rifles with bayonets, it seems very heroic and very dramatic. It's a ranged weapon and has it at close range. According to bayonet wounds, there were actually very few casualties due to bayonets. So I want you to keep in mind, when we are talking about hand-to-hand -hand combat, when we are talking about fixing bayonets at famous locations, such as Little Round Top, part of the reason these are so famous is because these are extreme circumstances. Bayonet combat is extremely dangerous because essentially you're equalizing things. You don't have many advantages when it comes to position of fire, when it comes to ammunition, et cetera. It's a slugfest. So for that reason, bayonets are really used on a minimal in the Civil War. 
And you can see over here some of the most common rifles that are going to be used during the Civil War. In some cases, some of them um, over 20 years old. And essentially, we're going to be going through a revolution when it comes to um, warfare during the war, not in terms of the weapons themselves, but in terms of the weapons and how they're being used. When it comes to these rifles, these rifles are essentially, for the time period, state of the art in terms of accuracy. And they are going to be disastrously used as if they were turn of the century muskets from the American Revolution and the Napoleonic Wars. This lack of technology, this lack of advancement is going to be evident in the military sciences. And although so many people credit Robert E. Lee as being the true, you know, the great military genius of the Civil War, the truth is he was using, in some cases, dangerously using a very antiquated type of warfare that didn't match up with the, with the technology at the time. By the end of the war, the military science catches up with the industrial science when it comes to war fighting. And it's at that point that we start seeing civil, um, we start seeing warfare more closely resembling trench warfare during the First World War. So I was mentioning before, you can see over here the difference between having a rifle uh, bore and having a smooth bore. A smooth bore means it has no grooves in the middle. Rifle bore means it looks like the inside of the gun barrel in the beginning of James Bond, those spiraled grooves that would allow um, whatever it fired to spin a little bit like a football. This gave it more accuracy and more distance. When it came to a smooth bore rifle, this would cause the bullet to wobble, lose its momentum and lose its accuracy. The rifles that you see on the top, this technology is part of the reason why Civil War uh, casualties were so deadly. They were using incredibly disastrous war techniques, which was fighting shoulder to shoulder, staying in close formation. That is um, borderline for both sides, for Union and Confederate forces. It is a very deadly way for fighting warfare and a very ineffective. And you can also see here the different types of projectiles that they will be shooting. Um, the most common, many of you probably heard it, is the mini ball, which is on the top left and top right. The mini does not refer to the size of it. It's just a variation of a, a name of an officer who's credited with them. And you can also see over here some of the other bullets that are used that are more effective in terms of being able to shoot accurately and at long distances with rifled bullets or I'm sorry, with rifle um, barrels. And continuing on, we're gonna briefly go into the weapons that cavalry units would use. Now, in terms of um, personal sidearms, they would be having carbines. Carbines are rifles that are specifically designed with a shorter barrel so that they can more easily be carried and fired while on horseback. And something that I do wanna mention is that when it comes to the misconception we have of cavalry warfare, you might oftentimes you, all of these cavalry soldiers charging into battle. Guess what? If you're charging into battle on a several hundred pound animal, you're making yourself a much larger target. So for that reason, although there were, in some cases, enormous cavalry conflicts where we had mounted soldiers fighting other mounted soldiers, on a whole, cavalry was, prim was primarily used the same way we might use Jeeps in the military today. Their main advantage was that they had units who could be quickly moved to a location where they could dismount and then they could engage their opponents. So keep in mind, when it comes to cavalry, the most useful form of cavalry were units who would dismount and then engage their enemy. Engaging your enemies while you were on horseback, I wanna make it clear, this did happen. We will be going over some of the major encounters that they did, but it was less desirable than dismounting. And then in terms of other weapons that would be used uh, by uh, cavalry units, we would have shotguns, specifically sawed off shotguns so that they could be uh, fired and carried more easily, and also sabers. And also we would have artillery. Specifically, we're gonna be going through four different types of artillery throughout this entire program. And just so everyone is familiar, when we say artillery, we don't simply mean cannons in general. There are many different artillery pieces and in some cases, the artillery is going to change as the war goes on. The first one that you see over here is the most common type of artillery during the Civil War. This is known as field artillery. Uh, these are cannons that were meant to be brought into battle by a team of horses. It would then be assembled. And we have actually tried firing some of these artillery pieces today. They are still quite accurate for the time period. And it would have a team of people that would be using on these 
uh, that would be using um, these pieces, I should mention. And it's also worth mentioning that when it comes to artillery, you didn't have to simply destroy the gun to make it inoperable. If you simply killed or injured enough people in an artillery crew, that gun can't be fired. At. And the same applied to siege artillery. Now, when it comes to siege artillery, this was different than field artillery because field artillery was meant to be used for siege warfare where you're attacking opponents' defenses as well as attacking opponents' infantry or cavalry. Siege artillery was specifically designed for attacking either stationary targets or targets where you wouldn't need to worry about moving the siege piece. So these were very heavy guns. In some cases, uh, they would actually be brought by train. And uh, specifically, we're going to be seeing these more often when it comes to, as the name describes, sieges, where we would have a city that would be in a fixed location, such as Atlanta or Petersburg is the board. And the very big one, the biggest guns that we see during the Civil War are known as heavy artillery. And you can see over here that um, these are actually cannons that were not meant to be physically moved from their location where they were deployed. This photograph is actually from the defenses in Washington, D.C. And you can see over here that these were physically incredibly large weapons. Uh, some cases, these are some of the uh, most modern and uh, in terms of cannon design. And as you can see on the bottom, you can see how it rotates around here on a, a rail system that um, they were actually quite innovative when it came to using these to their maximum effect. When it comes to the defenses of Washington, D.C., which we will be going into, the city of Washington, D.C. completely transforms during the Civil War, not only militarily, but even in terms of population. It just, we see Washington, D.C. go from what was previously just a rather generic national capital to becoming one of the most heavily fortified cities in the entire world. And this artillery piece that you see over here is just one of the hundreds that will be done in Washington, D.C. during this time. Yeah, fun thing I might as well mention, this is also a uh, glorious time for facial hair in uh, US photographic history. I've actually spoken to Doris Kearns Goodwin about that. She was at Troy, uh, New York one time doing a book signing for her book, The Bully Pulpit. She has gone on record talking to Joe Donahue that she thinks every man should be wearing beards. And um, I, I can definitely say that when it comes to, if you are researching Civil War history, you are eventually going to be developing an appreciation for each one. So continuing on when it comes to the artillery pieces, these are the different types of um, artillery projectiles that would be launched at the opponent. Some of them would have a fuse inside them so that it would explode overhead. Other times they might actually have small bits inside them which would shoot akin to shrapnel. And other times it would just be either a simple solid shot or might even be what's called a canister shot. We'll be going into a canister burst if you can imagine it was an object roughly the size of a coffee can that essentially transformed a cannon into an enormous shotgun these canisters would be filled with ball bearings which could range from the size of say a marble which would be no different than a regular mini ball you would put into a, a rifle to larger shots such as grape shots, which could be roughly the size of billiard balls. As you can see from the diagram in the center, what a canister shot did is after fighting it up to 100 yards, it would essentially be creating a sphere or an oval ranging from 11 to 32 feet wide. And as you can imagine, anything that is hit by these projectiles is gonna be completely destroyed. Limbs are gonna be either knocked off or rendered um, so damaged that they have to be amputated. And going up to 200 yards, as you can see over here, 83% of these projectiles will still be in this sort of amorphous um, center of roughly 22 feet wide. So as I said, up to 200 yards, use your imagination when it comes to that. That's twice the length of a standard um, you know, racing track. These are quite deadly weapons for a period where some individuals will be literally marching right up to these type of cannons when it comes to attacks such as Pickett's Charge at Gettysburg. And as a result, <clears throat> just um, going into the, the details of it, I'm showing these images to put something in your mind. We are never going to see a movie that accurately shows what Civil War combat is like. 
The reason why is because any movie that was accurately showing how bloody this war was would probably be rated X, it'd probably be NC-17, they wouldn't be able to show it. This is a horrifically bloody battle, not only in terms of cash, not only in terms of death, but also in terms of permanent injuries that people will be suffering from this. So use your imagination when it comes to how destructive these individual weapons, such as artillery, would be during the Civil War. And lastly, my personal favorite, experimental weapons. This is going to be a period of incredible technological breakthrough in the United States. The amount of patents in the country is going to, um, I've seen estimates as many as triple during the American Civil War years. And in many cases, it's because of Abraham Lincoln himself. Abraham Lincoln is the only president we've ever had who was a patented inventor. He patented a device when he was a younger man for uh, the expression was buoying vessels over shoals. Shoals were sort of um, almost miniature dams that they would have in waterways. And Lincoln designed a method for buoying a vessel over a shoal if it got stuck. After, as a young man, he observed a, um, a raft that had gotten stuck on one. So as a result, Abraham Lincoln, he had an open door at the White House for inventors. He, in some cases, personally fired new rifles that were being tested for the military. And um, one of the most famous, uh, or one of the most consequential, I should say, innovations of the war is the beginning of automatic rifles, specifically over here, the machine gun, also known as the Gatling gun after its inventor. We do see several of these pieces actually used and deployed near the very end of the war, specifically uh, during siege attempts at uh, Atlanta or at Petersburg. And probably the most consequential invention of the entire war, I mean, naturally, there is a lot of uh, personal opinions when it comes to this, but in terms of a weapon that overnight completely changed warfare around the entire world, it is the ironclad, which we will be going into a little bit more detail during the Battle of Hampton Roads in 1862. So in terms of Civil War strategy, as mentioned, the, the predominant infantry tactics that are gonna be used during the war is known as Napoleonic warfare, where the formation of soldiers would be in roughly parallel lines, roughly two parallel lines, I should mention, that are about 175 yards across. You can see over here that about 500 yards in advance of these infantry lines would be groups of skirmishers, sentries, picket men, and then uh, going forth that uh, this main infantry division would be broken in half and would have a colonel in command of a group of, uh, it, it actually depended, um, like the numbers changed in terms of the size of regiments uh, and um, brigades throughout the entire war. But roughly, as you can see over here, this formation that the way would have groups and even in some cases see the individual size of the, uh, or the individual number of the companies in here. This is an excellent breakdown of what units would be arranged during the Civil War. And as for artillery, as you can see here, artillery would roughly be a little bit under 20 yards apart each time. Uh, each person or most of the guns would have a nine man crew. And you can see over here that roughly six horses would be necessary in order to transport every single one of the guns. And when it comes to the uh, military science that many of the generals and officers would be using, Many of them would have been students of the writing of General von Clausewitz, whose famous work on war was one of the assigned readings over at West Point and one of the more consequential works when it comes to the formation of military science during this time period. It's also worth mentioning that, let me go back for a second, it is worth mentioning when it comes to von Clausewitz that he famously said that war is simply politics by other means. So for that reason, both sides will be trying to exploit political situations to their advantage during the war, the Union and the Confederacy. So when it comes to the Union strategy during the Civil War, uh, General Winfield Scott, old fuss and feathers, who um, incredible general worth mentioning for the Mexican War, is unfortunately too old to be presiding command. And uh, later in his life, he actually became uh, rather unhealthy due to an enormous amount of weight that he put on. Scott's Anaconda Plan, as it was derided, called on surrounding the Confederacy with the naval blockade, and then essentially strangling the Confederates economically and putting them in a position where they can no longer essentially have the ability to fight the war unless they had outside help, which would be denied to them. 
And although this was criticized for being, um, the reason why this was criticized, I should mention, is that um, in the North, it was believed to be giving too much credit to the Confederacy. Both sides thought that the war would be over very quickly. They didn't think that we would need to muster the Navy, establish a blockade. So many of these elements in the first year of the war would be considered fanciful, or even in some cases, uh, evidence of uh, essentially uh, mental turpitude by officers who were saying that it would be a long and very bloody war. But by the second year of the war, Scott's Anaconda plan is essentially put into play. This is a strategy that will eventually win the war for the Union. A uh, Union blockade will be established. The success of the blockade has been debated, but I will say that in my own research on it, uh, we can say that the Union blockade did make life a little bit less pleasant for the Confederates, both militarily and in terms of civilian life. And also when it comes to his strategies for splitting the Confederacy in half by the Mississippi River and then invading the Confederate interior, this is eventually what is put into place. And when it comes to the Southern strategy during the American Civil War, their main military aims were for essentially maintaining their independence. So for that, they knew that they would be fighting a primarily defensive battle. Now, as you can see over here, their plan was to both defend their interior and also provoke the Union into engaging into risky actions where they could either destroy the Union on their own soil or they could invade the North, which happens less often, and they can force the Union into more risky situations. So over here, all of the blue arrows you see over here, these are military aims for the Union throughout the entire war. And for the Confederacy, you can see them marked with red. Uh, it is also worth mentioning that when it came to uh, the close proximity of Washington, D.C. and Richmond from each other, roughly 100 miles apart from each other, it's for this reason that we're not only going to be seeing major pressure made for um, the Union and the Confederates to threaten their respective capitals, but also we're going to be seeing, going back to Clausewitz, efforts by the Confederacy to have Maryland secede from the Union and join the Confederacy. Because Maryland is one of the few border states that is a slave state, but remains loyal to the Union. And if Maryland were to secede, Washington, D.C. would be completely surrounded by Confederate forces. Before I move on, does anyone have any questions about the Union or Confederate um, overarching strategy for the war? All right. I'm going on. If anyone does have any questions, feel free to drop them in chat. Hey, I, I had a question, not about that, but uh, about what you were talking about previously about the the, the uh, weapons and the the bullets and various types of bullets and stuff. Would the armies have to have supplied all those different types of bullets because the soldiers might have had all different kinds of weapons, or were the bullets and weapons somewhat interchangeable? That's actually a very good question. Uh, there are going to be different types of bullets that will be used and also different ways of, um, especially when it comes to rifle technology, there's going to be certain rifles, especially during the end of the war, that have to be reloaded via a cylinder that has a magazine with bullets in them. And um, when it comes to those very, um, the very rapid fire rifles, we should say, such as the Henry rifle, it's supposed to be one of the more uh, rapid fire guns. It essentially worked like a Winchester. You would shoot it, reload it by um, just sort of um, moving a barrel um, crank that would allow it to fire. That those rifles um, had a very specific magazine design for them to allow for their repeated shots. And uh, some soldiers would actually request family to buy them those weapons and send them to the front line. So in that case, um, some soldiers who would provide their own weapons would actually have an enormous advantage when it came to uh, their own personal safety during the war. But no, when it comes to, to answer your question, when it comes to the very basic weapons that would be assigned, such as Springfield rifles, um, standard um, weapons that would be given to them, they would also be given everything that they would need, more so in the Union than in the Confederacy. They would be given uh, all the necessary equipment they would need in order to fire. Any other questions? All right, continuing on. So as I said before, in both the North and the South, there was um, a massive misunderstanding 
of what this war was going to be like. And there were figures in the North, such as uh, not only General Scott, but also uh, General uh, William T. Sherman, who would actually be dismissed as uh, mentally unwell initially for their insistence that it's going to be a violent and a bloody struggle. From the Southern perspective, Sam Houston of Texas was eventually forced from power through essentially something akin to a Confederate coup d'etat. He does offer a commentary on how he believed the war was going to unfold. I'll read this. Let me tell you what is coming. After the sacrifice of countless millions of treasure and hundreds of thousands of lives, you may win Southern independence if God be not against you, but I doubt it. I tell you that while I believe with you in the doctrine of states' rights, the North is determined to preserve this union. They are not a fiery, impulsive people as you are, for they live in colder climates, but when they begin to move in a given direction, they move with the steady momentum and perseverance of a mighty avalanche. And what I fear is they will overwhelm the South. Which is eventually what does happen. So wrapping up the year of 1861, we have the first major battle of the war known as the Battle of Bull Run. Some of you might've heard two different terms for it. Um, many of the Confederates or Confederate historians, uh, they would name the battles after rivers that pass through them, such as Bull Run. Whereas when it comes to the Union, uh, they would tend, or more Northern, I should say, Northern historians would usually name it after the battle where it took place, such as in this case, Manassas Junction, instead of Antietam, named after Antietam Creek, they would call it the Battle of Sharpsburg. But it does seem that um, in terms of the public imagination that um, in my own searches, the, um, the more river-based titles or names for battles have won out in the long run. So, just so you know, when it comes to this particular course, when we are naming the battles, I will specify that Bull Run is not a specific town in Virginia, it's the river that the battle is named after. So this is the first major military engagement of the war between opposing armies over here, it takes place in July, 1861. Both sides were expecting it to be a rather quick battle. And the case could be made that the Possibly war on both sides could have ended during this one engagement. The Union has 35,000 troops, a little bit more than that. About half of them are engaged, roughly 18,000. For the Confederates, they have roughly the same, a little bit less, but again, about 18,000 engaged in uh, combat. And it's worth mentioning, if you look on the bottom of the map over here, this is going to be the first massive movement of uh, armed forces by railroad in the history of warfare. So what we have over here is uh, the Confederates had positioned themselves under a general um, PGT Beauregard. They were roughly about 25 miles away from Washington, DC in a position where they, th they could threaten the capital. Lincoln was aware of this, which is why he sent Union troops over to uh, disperse them. And one thing I do wanna clarify, this is not a period in the war where the Union is gonna be dressed all in blue and the Confederates are gonna be dressed all in gray. Specifically, when it comes to the Confederates wearing gray, that is actually much rarer than public imagination makes it uh, clear. Gray would have been an expensive dye for the Confederates. And when it comes to the most common color during the Civil War, for those who even had uniforms in the Confederacy, it would be a sort of butternut color. But when it comes to the specific battle, it is it literally is an incredible display of so many different regimental colors. Uh, there were even some Confederate forces that actually wore their family's revolutionary war uniforms, complete with the tri-corner hat going into battle. So there's going to be many, many different uh, uniform styles that are going into this battle. So just for clarity, the blue and the gray is really a simplification of what these soldiers actually wore in the battle. So under General McDowell, uh, Abraham Lincoln, as mentioned, dispatches about 25,000 soldiers. I'm sorry, about um, 35,000 soldiers over to repel the Confederates. And initially, the two sides almost completely uh, destroy each other's flanks, but eventually the Union is able to do the initial attack against the Confederate left flank that almost wins the day. What happens is the Confederates are eventually reinforced. They're able to uh, take position over here on Bald Hill. And uh, famously, this is where Thomas Jefferson Jackson is observed where someone says there he stands like a stone wall. 
This is where Stonewall Jackson got his name from. And eventually the Union is able to force back. And it's actually worth mentioning that there were many people from Washington who actually picnicked to watch this battle. They thought it would be entertaining. They would watch uh, something that hadn't happened in American history for 80 years, which was a revolution. Now, one thing I do want to mention when it comes to the casualties of this. So we have um, for the Union, about 500 dead, over 1,000 wounded, more than 1,000 are missing. And for the Confederates, uh, roughly the same casualties, but uh, much fewer missing. One thing I want to quickly mention when it comes to this battle is that General Beauregard, and this is actually not very well known, General Beauregard wanted to go to Washington, D.C. and actually take over the Union capital after this happened. He knew that they had just met the opponents on the battlefield. They had just dispersed them. And he knew that Washington during this time was very vulnerable. What happened was General, uh, what was it? General Beauregard was basically prevented from going further by the Confederate President Jefferson Davis. And the two of them had a private spat over decision-making that eventually became a public spat and was one of many, many embarrassing encounters with Jefferson Davis that in the post-war environment would be viewed as this one missed opportunity where if it wasn't for Jefferson Davis, the Confederacy would have won the war. The truth is, if the Confederates had marched on Washington, D.C., we do not know what would have happened. We do not know if Abraham Lincoln would have vacated the Capitol. We don't know if he would have been taken as a prisoner. Um, there's different ways that we could war game what might have happened. What we can say, though, is the Confederates are never going to find Washington more vulnerable throughout the war than it was during this time period. So this is an incredible and a seldomly discussed what if in American history. I myself had actually just researched this for a scholarly article I was writing on Washington's defenses. And we're going to be seeing that Lincoln is going to learn a very serious lesson when it comes to Washington, D.C.'s defenses during this time period. So that covers everything that we were supposed to uh, finish last week's discussion on. So I do apologize if I'm going at a little bit of a breakneck speed over here. I do get distracted and I sometimes wander. One of the fascinating things about this time period, there is so much to be talking about. I will say though, before we go into the first full year of the war, 1862, does anybody have any questions or observations over what we discussed during the first year of the war? All right, going on then, 1862. So let's see, just to briefly recap on um, what we should be taking away from the first year. Uh, so first of all, both sides were wrong. It was not a quick war. Both sides thought that the entire Confederate uh, Revolution or the entire Confederate insurrection could be won in a single battlefield. That did not happen. But the Confederates do emerge with their sovereignty intact. Keep in mind, their strategy was to simply stay alive as a nation and, if possible, to get foreign recognition. They're unable to do the latter, but they succeed at the, at the uh, former. They are able to essentially change a calendar year when they are separate from the United States. And as mentioned, they enjoy their first major victory on the battlefield during the Battle of Bull Run, which results in Abraham Lincoln putting out his call for volunteers. And again, going on just recapping, the Confederate strategy is to defend the South, threaten Washington, D.C., and receive foreign recognition. Union strategy is General Scott's Anaconda plan, as discussed before. Now, a very interesting question is emancipation. Abraham Lincoln himself, during the first inaugural address, made it very clear that it was not his aim to interfere with slavery. Can someone actually please read this passage from the first inaugural? Just unmute yourself. Please read this. You have one volunteer, please. I have no purpose, directly or indirectly, to interfere with the institution of slavery in the states where it exists. I believe I have no lawful right to do so, and I have no inclination to do so. Thank you very much, sir. So Lincoln made it very clear in his first inaugural that he did not want to fight a war. 
with the Confederacy or with the South or with any of the states. Furthermore, he was also aware that he had a very difficult task of not only fighting a war against a very openly slave-based nation, but at the same time trying to prevent the border states of Minnesota, Kentucky, Delaware, and Maryland from seceding as well and joining the Confederacy, along with a certain amount of U.S. senators and an enormous amount of U.S. soldiers. Specifically, the way Abraham Lincoln would describe it when it came to his personal thoughts of slavery and the issue of emancipation during the war, he once remarked, I would free every slave in the entire country. But specifically, he said, I would free every one of them if it would not result in another four states seceding and another million soldiers joining the Confederacy. So this whole issue of emancipation is going to be a very tricky political, uh, essentially a Gordian knot that Abraham Lincoln, as with all the founding fathers, is going to be wrestling with all the time throughout this war. But going back to the interior of the Confederacy, specifically along the Kentucky-Tennessee uh, border, a little bit closer to Missouri and Arkansas, I should say, we're going to be seeing several engagements over here that I'm very briefly going to touch upon, where General Grant, right over here, sees uh, his first major actions during the war over at Fort Henry and over at Fort Donaldson. It's actually going to be at the Battle of Fort Donaldson, where Grant uh, famously demands uh, the unconditional surrender of the fort. And for that reason, uh, uh, Ulysses S. Grant, U.S. Grant, got the nickname Unconditional Surrender Grant after that encounter. And for those of you who are interested when it comes to Grant, Grant is finally getting the reassessment he deserves in American scholarship. Um, Ron Chernow's book is fantastic. I do recommend it to everyone. Although it does not delve so much into the military science of Grant. And one example of that is when it comes to the Battle of Shiloh, which we're about to describe, entire books, in some cases, entire libraries of books have been written just on the Battle of Shiloh. And Ron Chernow, he only dedicates, if I'm not mistaken, I think like less than 10 pages in his book to the Battle of Shiloh. I do want to make it clear, if any of you do want a good military background on the American Civil War, specifically when it comes to Grant, don't read Chernow's book. Read Grant's memoirs. They are probably the greatest work of nonfiction ever written by a president. And I have heard them described as the greatest work of nonfiction ever in the United States. So please read that. It's a fantastic book. Ron Chernow's book is a very good accessory to it, specifically when it comes to the peripherals of Grant and his life and uh, those that he studied under and his presidency. But if you want to understand civil warfare, read Grant's memoirs. They are a masterpiece. So when it comes to the Battle of Shiloh, shown over here, April 6, 1862, and again, another anniversary. We're all passing these anniversaries. One of the things that we really see during this particular battle is how consequential the natural geography of these battlefields are going to be playing when it comes to the fighting itself. Now, keep in mind, just going back, before this battle, this was just a part of the United States. I mean, this was just, you know, little town or little region on the Tennessee River. Then all of a sudden, forests, roads, towns, fences, these all become important aspects of military science. And specifically, this sunken road right over here, as it's known, becomes a very consequential location when it comes to the Battle of Shiloh. Because when you have a sunken road, as you can see over here, it's basically an instant uh, rifle trench. You can have soldiers in there, in some cases, standing up vertically, and they'll be completely free, not only from uh, potential fire that they could be getting, but also they would be protected by earthenworks going around, which offer much better protection from shrapnel than, say, just uh, fences or even a stone wall might. So you can see over here one of the examples of the sunken roads and uh, some of the stone walls during the Battle of Shiloh and really throughout the entire Civil War that are going to be used by Union and Confederate soldiers, in some cases for very pitched battles. Simply a farmland is going to become incredibly desirable simply because of a stone wall that they happen to have over there. Or as mentioned, uh, like an area near a church or in a forest might be very desirable because of a sunken road that it has. So, this is one of the first major examples of how this natural and very diverse geography of the United States is going to be playing a major role in how these battles unfold. So initially, 
during the Battle of Shiloh, which is unfortunately a little bit of a confused mess for the Union forces coming in here. They find themselves fighting a retreat after they're encountered by General Johnston and his forces down over here in the south. The Union is driven back to this sunken road, which gets the name the Hornet's Nest. You can see I'm moving my cursor right over it. This is where the Union was able to hold off uh, the Confederates pretty well until the Confederates directed their artillery there. They were able to completely demolish the Hornet's Nest and overrun it. And the Union is almost chased off the battlefield at this point, back to the Tennessee River where they had reinforcements coming in. Now it's worth mentioning that over here, General Lew Wallace, some of you may have heard the name Lew Wallace before, he's actually the author of the best-selling book, Ben-Hur. This is where it came from. General Lew Wallace was the author of Ben-Hur. And I have read an essay that did speculate whether or not Wallace would have even written Ben-Hur if it wasn't for the terrible situation he found himself in during the Battle of Shiloh. What happened is he was given an order from General Grant that was not very clearly written. And essentially, I'm very much simplifying it. The order was essentially come in this direction to the battlefield. And he found himself at a fork and he didn't know which way to go. So what happened is he took a wrong direction and he ended up arriving very late into the battle where the Union had almost been driven off the battlefield. He then does join the battle and plays an incredibly crucial role in uh, defending the Union troops. But eventually, he is the subject of very undeserved blame for the Union performance during the war. And it's actually for the personal suffer and embarrassment that he suffered for this that he ended up writing the book Ben-Hur, which, as many of you may know, is about a man in uh, the Roman Empire, specifically in Judea, who um, is wrongfully accused of a crime, as are his so the, the, the essay is called The Ghosts of Lew Wallace. I believe it's called The Ghosts of Lew Wallace, if anyone is interested. It's a fantastic little exploration on how uh, one of the most famous works of American literature was influenced by this unfortunate encounter during an incredibly bloody battle during the opening moments of the Civil War. So Grant, after this battle, he actually met with Sherman the night before. And it's actually this friendship between Sherman and Grant becomes one of the most consequential during the war. Uh, General Sherman met with Grant under a tree, supposedly Grant was by himself. And Sherman said, um, they gave us hell today. And Grant said, yeah, let them tomorrow, which they did. The Union is able to counterattack and uh, repel the Confederates back and beyond the hornet's nest and eventually enjoy a very important but an incredibly costly battle in uh, this opening era. In terms of the total casualties, and let me just go back for a second. In terms of total casualties, the dead and wounded at Shiloh alone were larger and more numerous than, I'm not sure how accurate this statement is because uh, we are learning a little bit more about total casualties during the American Revolutionary War. But in terms of public imagination, they were, it was reported that more soldiers either died or were wounded or were taken prisoner or were unaccounted for at the Battle of Shiloh than at every previous American war. So this is a cataclysmic battle when it comes to the public understanding of the war, both North and South, but particularly the North. Could someone please read this passage here when it comes to uh, the Battle of Shiloh? This is actually from Grant's memoirs. Volunteer, please. Some critics claim that Shiloh was won when Johnson fell and that if he had not fallen, the army under me would have been annihilated or captured. Commanding generals are liable to be killed during engagements, and the fact that when he was shot, Johnson, Johnston was leading a brigade to induce it to make a charge, which had been repeatedly ordered, is evidence that there was neither the universal demoralization on our side, nor the unbounded confidence on theirs, which has been claimed. Excellent, thank you very much. Please, um, let's see, what do I have over here? Please continue. There was, in fact, no hour during the day when I doubted the eventual defeat of the enemy, although I was disappointed that reinforcements so near at hand did not arrive at an earlier hour. Excellent. Thank you very much. So I just want to say that the reason why I chose this passage was not simply because of its details of the battle. 
uh, specifically Johnston, uh, his leg was nicked and he ended up uh, bleeding profusely into his boot during the battle. And this did play a major role in uh, the Confederates retreating. Specifically, this is very typical of the mindset that Grant has during not only the Civil War, but during some of the worst, most horrific battles during the Civil War, such as Shiloh, such as the Battle of the Wilderness, such as the Petersburg Campaign, which is that he just has, no pun intended, a very sober aspect to essentially the reality of battlefield. He's not saying that he didn't win this battle because the opponent general got killed. Like he partially, like the opponent got killed because he was on the battlefield. He has this very simple way of rationalizing decisions or situations and also a gaming how a battle will unfold. And it's this understanding that he has, whereas he said that he never doubted uh, their victory, that is going to be so incredibly useful to Grant and also to the Union effort during the last years of the war. Because Robert E. Lee is famous for being able to understand his opponent, being able to outthink them, understand them. And he even once remarked that uh, the, he's going to understand generals until the Union finds someone that he doesn't understand. When that happens, the Union will defeat him. Uh, eventually, that never happened. What happened was the, uh, the, the General Grant, Lee did understand, but Grant was still able to win because Grant would not allow himself or his actions to be determined by his opponents. Lee was very good at destroying a general's ambition or their pride or their severity of mind. Grant, however, was from this very, very early battle, was very fixed on his opponents. And oh my God, one description that I've heard when it comes to Grant and just this sort of almost like borderline this stoic, almost robotic mindset that he had. Someone said that he had an expression on his face as if he was about to just bash his head through a brick wall. I've also heard Grant described as having no more expression on his face than last year's bird's nest. So continuing off of the Eastern Theater during this first full year of the war. Now, as mentioned, one of the first major uh, factors or transformations, I should say, that the Union goes through is they start fortifying Washington, D.C. after that disastrous uh, near loss they have in Washington after the Battle of Shiloh. What you see over here is a map of Washington, D.C. during the Civil War. I notice over here, this is including the entire 100 square miles of the original District of Columbia. Uh, now the Virginia part has been ceded to Virginia. So every single blue X that you see is a major fort that's going to be erected during the Civil War. I do want to mention that these aren't large wooden forts. You can imagine this, you know, like Lincoln Logs or Corduroy, et cetera. Specifically, these are going to be earthen works forts that are dug into the ground. So going through, there is just a remarkable scientific process that is used over the placement of the forts, the crossfire that they have. I'm not exaggerating when I say this. Over the course of four years, Washington, D.C. literally becomes comparable to Malta and Gibraltar and Singapore. It becomes one of the most heavily fortified cities in the entire world during the 19th century. And one of the main uh, reasons for this is uh, we have a new commander and really the person who's really credited for creating the Army of the Potomac, which is General George D. McClellan. McClellan is a controversial figure. In terms of um, his education, he, he was genius in terms of, uh, I mean, for those who knew him in terms of planning, logistics, he was one of the smartest people in the entire US military. He was someone who, if you made him a quartermaster, everyone would be getting their turkeys on Thanksgiving. He was someone where if you gave him, uh, if you gave him an army, everyone would be trained and drilled and proud and wearing uniforms. If you gave him a city like Washington, DC, he would turn it into one of the most fortified cities in the entire world. The problem with McClellan is that his success when it came to building the Army of the Potomac was not as equally matched when it came to sending the Army of the Potomac into battle. And there's actually, um, I'll get into that criticism of that later. Specifically, when it comes to this first full year of the war, his objectives are as follows. To capture or destroy the Army of Northern Virginia, which it's worth mentioning, Robert E. Lee, um, uh, during this time period, he, Robert E. Lee was not in control of the Army of Northern Virginia during the Battle of Bull Run. He eventually assumes control uh, during his encounters with uh, George McClellan. 
Uh, also, the Army of the Potomac is to capture Richmond, Virginia. And specifically, the effort that he's doing to do this becomes known as the Peninsula Campaign, where McClellan was going to have an enormous fleet drop off his army, uh, just under about 100,000 troops, over on uh, this peninsula, Fort Monroe in Virginia. And they were going to march up this peninsula and take the capital of Richmond. Uh, this is a very complex way of bringing the soldiers down. It actually has uh, quite a few problems, specifically when it came to farrowing them down some of the narrower waterways of the Potomac River. But if a different general was in command, this might have won the war for the Union. But the problem is General McClellan brought himself into battle. And one of the first encounters he has is his army is briefly held back by skeleton units of Confederates that are armed with Quaker cannons. What are Quaker cannons? They are logs painted to look like cannons, which was actually first used by uh, George Washington during the sieging of Boston during the American Revolution. Now it is, uh, now keep in mind that um, when it came to the psychology that we were mentioning with General Grant, how Grant would not be deterred by anything that the opponents threw at him, McClellan was the exact opposite. He was consistent, he was constantly duped into thinking that the Confederates were much larger than they were. He believed that there was maybe a million Confederates in between him and Richmond. Uh, and the thing is the Confederate generals used this against him. During his approach to Richmond, during the Peninsula Campaign, uh, the one Confederate officer opposing him, he actually had his band play very, very loud music and would actually march in and out of visible ranges and forests in a straight line to make his army seem much larger than it actually was. It worked like a charm on General McClellan. McClellan had an enormous army. During this time period, as I said, he outnumbered the Confederates roughly 10 to one, and he lost crucial weeks during the initial months, or the, during the initial weeks of the Peninsula Campaign, really because of his own error. But eventually he does engage the Confederates in battle in what's known as the Seven Days. But before we go into that, we have one of the most consequential engagements of the war when it comes to naval history. What happens is there was a little bit of something akin to an arms race between the North and the South when it came to developing ironclads. Ironclads were warships that were not built entirely out of um, metal, but rather had a uh, metal hull or protector on them that would allow them to be essentially impervious to cannon fire. So during this Battle of Hampton Roads in Virginia, we saw a Confederate ironclad engage uh, the Union Navy and actually sink two ships over here. And make no mistake, according to the diary of Gideon Wells, Abraham Lincoln was horrified of this ironclad, which was known as the Virginia. Lincoln was afraid that it was going to sail the Potomac River and it would shell the White House and there would be absolutely nothing anybody could do to reject it. This is not hyperbole. This is from Gideon Wells' own diaries. Lincoln would literally look outside the window of the White House expecting this ironclad vessel to destroy the mansion. But instead, eventually the Union in a very urgent rush is able to continue work on an ironclad that was originally proposed to them earlier and uh, eventually sees battle over at Hampton Roads. And over the course of this incredibly chaotic morning of battle, from 7 a.m. until um, the early uh, afternoon, the ironclads bump into each other constantly. Their, um, their cannons are literally rubbing against each other. And it's eventually a stalemate, but the Confederates do retreat. To quote, let me go back for a moment, to quote um, Ken Burns in his documentary, I actually think this is the best uh, description of this encounter. The entire world, we have the reports going back to Europe, the entire world was watching with fascination as these two ironclad warships battled each other. Because at that moment, quoting uh, Ken Burns, every single Navy in the entire world was obsolete. In this one moment, the United States and the Confederate Navy together were able to field warships that literally no other Navy in the entire world would be able to stop. But very quickly, going back to uh, the land engagements when it comes to the Seven Days, uh, going over here with these encounters, you can see them marked over here, Canningsville, Gaines Mill, Salvage Station. One after another, McClellan is fighting these engagements outside of Richmond. And he's actually winning quite a few of them. 
But, oh, let me quickly see. Uh, we have a comment over here from Matthew. Is it true that the iron from the northern ship, um, that's the, uh, the monitor, was made in Troy at the Bernstein Ironworks? I actually, I have heard quite a lot about um, the Albany and Capital Region's contribution when it came to the monitor. I do know that the, the commandant of the, um, the Naval Academy, he would eventually uh, be the, the commander uh, put in charge of the monitor. I believe he was from the Albany Troy region. Uh, when it comes to the iron from the ship, I do not know for sure, but it would not surprise me one bit because when it comes to the, oh yes, uh, Ron says, I've heard that as well and shipped down Houston to Brooklyn. That's what I do know. Shipped down to Houston, to Brooklyn, the Navy Yard where the monitor was built. Uh, as I said, I mean, it makes sense. It's on the Hudson River. We already know that a lot of the material would have been going down there anyway. So I would say either the iron, uh, I would probably say the iron at the very least passed through Troy. I can't say for sure it would, if it was from the Burden Iron Works, but I could uh, research that. This is actually one of the advantages of having something like this in New York. There is so much local history that we could be going into during this time period and is readily available to us. So um, yes, then sailed down uh, coast to the south where eventually the monitor is unfortunately uh, forced to be scuttled. They set it on fire so that it can't be captured by the Confederates. But uh, it's, not the only, um, it's not the only ironclad that the Union fields. By the end of the war, we're gonna have an entire fleet of ironclad vessels, more detailed and more advanced than uh, the monitor was. But we are approaching the end of our discussion today. Um, as you can probably guess, uh, oh wait, what is it? now in a water tank undergoing conservation. That is correct. The USS Monitor Museum, if any of you are interested, I know um, I'm personally in touch with one of the, um, uh, what is it, one of the historians over at the USS Monitor uh, National Historic Site. It is being preserved. We do have people dedicated to answering any nerdy question you have about the Monitor. I'm speaking from experience. I've sent them many messages on Twitter and they've answered each one. So please, if you are interested, I know that during COVID, we can't be traveling as much as we would like to, but really take advantage of these sources that are available online. We still have people over there that are working at these museums and preserving uh, these relics of the war. But uh, with that said, uh, we're about halfway into 1862, but we will continue this as we go into next week's class, where we will uh, finish 1862, go into the battles of Antietam, the Emancipation Proclamation, and eventually Lee's first and second invasions of the North. But uh, before we part, does anybody have any questions or comments over anything that we discussed so far today? A comment about the Battle of Philo. Um, my understanding is that the, uh, the battle was, was commenced with a surprise attack on a Sunday morning and that the, uh, the Union Army was caught uh, by surprise and that many were killed in their tents. Mm -hmm. And that uh, the Union Army uh, was furiously angry about this, not just during the battle, but long after it. And uh, this was uh, perhaps one of the things that motivated Sherman's army when they went on their march. Uh, that they felt that the Confederates had had used uh, improper or unfair tactics and, and they were uh, bent on revenge. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, uh, going back, to, uh, just to um, address the second part, uh, I want to do that first since um, it is very relevant to the first part of your question, that early on the war, especially when it comes to, um, say, the aftermath of the First Battle of Bull Run, there are going to be atrocities committed by the Confederacy, such as um, in uh, Shalom, I'm sorry, the Battle of Bull Run in particular, when it comes to the desecration of uh, Union grave sites. And, uh, and then of course, claims that General Sherman and his soldiers did the same thing when they were invading Georgia, even though we know that that was not true. But um, when it does come to Shiloh, uh, there was, uh, going back to really to the whole idea of Shiloh Church and even the word Shiloh, means peace, that uh, there were many reasons, both from a religious point of view and also just from a military point of view for the Union to vilify the South when it comes to Shiloh. Shiloh was a very bloody battle, very hard fought one. 
One, as you mentioned, start off with a surprise attack. Soldiers never liked doing anything early in the day because it was so exhaustive to be a, a soldier. They needed to rest. They needed to have their breakfast. And of course, keep in mind, they were wearing very uncomfortable wool uniforms during this time period. So basically, everyone who was in Shiloh essentially had reason to hate everything about their experience in Shiloh. But when it does come to what you were saying, when it comes to, uh, I don't want to call them unchivalrous behavior. I want to call them what we would call them now, which are war crimes. When it comes to the execution of prisoners, particularly black soldiers, when it comes to the kidnapping of free blacks, when uh, Robert E. Lee's army invades the North, when it comes to the mistreatment of prisoners, when it comes to the defiling of uh, the dead, uh, I will politely and generously say that it was not exclusive to the North or the South. I will say though, that when it comes to the execution of black soldiers, when it came to the uh, imprisonment or when it came to the kidnapping of free blacks, as um, the forces, as the armies were moving through the country, that was exclusively a Confederate treat. One thing I do want to mention over here, I have two comments in the chat, one from Art. Uh, was the Potomac River navigable all the way up to the District of Columbia? Um, it depends on what the vessel was. Uh, Gideon Wells does comment on this in his diary when he came to Lincoln's fears over the, um, the US, uh, the, sorry, the Confederate ship uh, the Confederate ironclad Virginia sailing up to uh, the Potomac to Washington and showing the White House. Most likely, the vessel would not have been able to do that. That's what Gideon Wells, the Secretary of the Navy, was able to assess. So depending on the ships, some of them could go up to the District of Columbia, but uh, not heavier ships. And let's see, Ron, I was under the impression that this was so. As I said, it depends on the ship. Most likely, when it comes to an ironclad, where most of the hull is underwater, uh, they, that ship probably would not have been able to go up to the uh, up to the district through the Potomac River. And Ed and Margot Rosen wrote, a major role of uh, birds and iron during the war was the production of horseshoes. It is actually, um, it is so interesting to hear these little roles that so many different towns end up providing during the Civil War. This one town will be known because they provided all the belt buckles that the Union had during the time. Another one might be famous for providing a tin, uh, you know, like tin canned food that the soldiers were eating. Uh, it is worth mentioning that three million horses will be serving in the Civil War, and uh, very suddenly discussed, and roughly one million horses, unfortunately, are going to be killed during this war. So when we're talking about casualties during the disease, disease, when we're talking about poor sanitation, just keep in mind that in addition to so many of these horrible horrible um, situations where we have dead or wounded soldiers on battlefields. We also have 1 million dead horses lining the battlefields of this country as well across the country. But that said, it's been a pleasure to speak to you during this one hour. If any of you have any questions, feel free to email me. My email should be on the syllabus. If you don't have the syllabus, the library should be able to help you with that. Otherwise, thank you all so very much for this conversation. And I want to read this um, one last line from Ron Ginsburg. Bad on both sides, but um, what was different was that the South wouldn't treat Black soldiers as prisoner of the war, and the North then stopped paroling them. Yes, that is very true. And uh, Ron Chernow does a very good job going into that when it comes to Robert E. Lee. Robert E. Lee probably could, if he wanted to, have allowed for Black soldiers to be paroled in exchange for prisoners. He made it very clear to Grant that um, he wasn't going to be doing that. And really, that in addition to the treatment of soldiers at uh, Confederate prisons, such as Andersonville, Georgia, and uh, massacres as demonstrated in Fort Pillow, all those collectively lead to the Union eventually no longer exchanging prisoners with the South. But that should be a subject for our next class. Otherwise, thank you all so much for your time. Have a very good weekend.